So yeah, we are going to be led by you for a workshop on mindful nutrition. So yeah, yeah I'm so excited for this because as we've seen, every panel mm -hmm. has touched on food and nourishing ourselves. And yes. to be honest, between myself and Legina, our relationship with food is probably the most tumultuous when our mental health is suffering. And it's really the first sign of, wait, let me check in with myself that I eat today. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to, to hear from you. So to kick it off, I'll just, um, we'll do it like a little fireside chat, like we've been doing just so we can get to know you and then I'll hand it off to you and then we'll come back off camera and off mute when it's time to wrap things up. Um, but yeah, so how, so you're a, a registered dietitian. Yeah. So what is a registered dietitian and how did you come into the field of nutrition? Um, so a registered dietitian, usually we, we just get called nutritionists, um, but registered dietitians, we go through a four-year university. Um, our major was actually updated. So now you need to have a master's degree, um, just because it's so intensive. Uh, you learn about anatomy, physiology, you learn about everything about the body and dietetics dietitian is uh, we practice a lot of medical nutrition therapy. Um, dietitians, you know, we, after four years of, of undergrad or now even master's, we have to do a 1200 hour internship in different settings, you know, clinical food service, and then whatever else ca catches your interest. And we have to take an exam uh, to become registered or licensed. Um, so our official title, uh, title is Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Um, so a big thing that I do like to tell people is that anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. If someone isn't a registered dietitian, you know, anyone and their mama can just say, oh, I'm a nutritionist because I took a week long course or I'm passionate and I watch Netflix documentaries. So I'm a nutritionist. Um, do be aware of that because nutrition, yes, it's food. We all eat, but just because we all eat doesn't mean that we have the understanding and the knowledge to help others and guide others on how to go about for their nutrition. So that's a big thing that y'all need to have in mind when finding someone to work with. Um, and then how I came into this field, I, you know, it was by coincidence. Um, I'm a first generation Latina. I am the first one in my family to graduate from university. So for all of you that are first gen, like you got to figure it out. You get thrown into college and it's like, okay, what do I do? Like what's FASA? What's this? Um, so I, I didn't know what a dietitian was. I've heard of that a nutritionist, never of a dietitian. Um, and it wasn't until like my third year of college that they're like, okay, Elizabeth, you gotta pick a major. <laughs> like you're you're a third year, what's gonna happen here? Um, and they're like, what do you like? And I'm like, well, I like food, I like exercising. And they're like, okay, we got a major for you, dietetics. And I'm like, what the heck is that? They're like, you know, it's like nutrition, you learn about food. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, so that's kind of how I stumbled upon this major. Um, and it wasn't until I was in it that I really fell in love with it because I started to see that, you know, there was just a lack of diversity in nutrition and, you know, coming with my background of like being Mexican American, it's like you, it just opens your eyes to see how you can make a difference. Um, especially when you start working with the community, you see how, how much impact you can create. Okay, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great story of um, making sure that we know the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian um, so that we're you know, leaving our, our nutrition advice in the right hands, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, not only is the field of, or I guess dietitians, not as diverse as you know, our population reflects, um, but also the teachings, right? Because mm -hmm. when, you, when we learn about, you know, health food or go to certain experts, it's not necessarily accessible to communities of color. And it kind of, 
doesn't include a lot of our ancestral and cultural foods. Um, so yeah. can you tell us about that? Because I know you're, you're very passionate about that. And that's why we're excited to, to hear from you specifically. But yeah, just let us know um, kind of more of your why. Um, that's a good question. So I, um, you know, when I was in school, you do learn like your curriculum and you're like, okay, like buy the books and like, this is what you learn. But it's not until you go out into the real world and you start like using your, um, what's it called? Your, um, like really start to look beyond like what you're being taught and like what you're learning in the text and really seeing that, you know, in school. And like, even if you look at like, <clears throat> like educational materials from like, um like the American Heart Association or other like public resources that are related to nutrition they don't speak about how to go about it if you're trying to eat healthier but you're from a, a Latino culture you're from an Asian background you're from an Indian background it's like how can I incorporate those foods that I grew up eating if I want to eat healthier just live a, a healthier lifestyle overall um, we see it a little bit more now, but it's just, I feel like as a society and like as, um, you know, the, the health and fitness industry is very whitewashed. You like, if you think about like, okay, if, if Mel were, was to say like, oh, I want to eat healthier. I want to start just living a healthier life, lifestyle. The first things that come to mind is like, well, you can't eat your cultural foods because they're bad. Um, in my case, it's like Mexican, like, oh, you can't eat Mexican food. Mexican food is bad. Um, you got to eat your, your grilled chicken, your brown rice and your broccoli, and you got to go to the gym five times a day. And it's really like this, um, like generic idea we have of health and of nutrition. And what I try to try to educate people on is like, no, like, that's not how it has to be. Nutrition is flexible. Nutrition should be flexible. It should be tailored to your lifestyle. And of course, I'm speaking more to like the general population. When you have a medical condition, it's a completely different conversation. But if you're someone that, you know, for the most part, you're healthy, you don't have like severe conditions, then yes, you can be flexible. You can, you know, have a slice of pizza. You can have like your mofongo and like your tamales. Um, it's all about having that flexibility, that moderation. Um, and that's like a big thing that I try to convey to the community because I do work in community nutrition. And what I would notice is like a big barrier that keeps you from even trying to eat a little healthier is this idea or like this misconception that, well, if I have to eat healthier, I have to abandon my foods. And it's like, no, like that's, you don't have to do that. Um, so I'm really passionate about, you know, conveying that message to the community. And I also work at an eating disorder facility. So I'm really big on body image and like making peace with food and just, you know, working on your, on your mindset and working on this, on the inside, sorry, it's sensor lights. <laughs> um, working on, on your mindset and working on the inside, because oftentimes, and we're, I'll talk about this a little, a little more, but oftentimes when it's like, I want to, I want to eat healthier and be healthier. We just think exercise, nutrition. It's like, okay, but what about the inside? What about the way you see yourself, the way you see food? Um, so that's also something that I like to work with clients. Um, and sometimes they're like, well, you're a dietitian. Like, why are we talking about this? And it's like, because everything's connected. Um, the way you see food, the way you see yourself, you know, all these different, how you deal with stress, are you even sleeping? All these things are interconnected and you just can't look at just your food or just your exercise. Right. Yes. You know, of course, around here, we believe in holistic health, holistic nutrition, mm -hmm. holistic wellness. Um, so I love that. Yeah. You champion that everything is connected. Um, Legina dropped into the chat, right? I am never giving up on soul food. Um, 
Jessica, uh, I will hand it over to you to go through our workshop. Um, you do have Thank the ability you. to share the screen if you needed to. And okay. yeah, I'll be monitoring the chat. I'll let you know if we have any questions or like um, feedback, if people are loving it. Um, and then, yeah, we'll just come off of camera and mute when it's uh, time to wrap up. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Give me one second. Um, okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, looks beautiful. Awesome. Okay. Let me just move this. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm Elizabeth Valencia. If you guys didn't catch that, um, sorry, next. Okay. So as I mentioned, like one of the reasons why I, I'm very passionate about nutrition and like my philosophy kind of includes cultural foods and cultural representation and the lack of cultural, of the lack of cultural representation is one of the biggest things that has, you know, kept me more, more passionate in here. And that, you know, if you do a simple Google search, like healthy meals or healthy dinners, you rarely see cultural foods. Um, it's starting to change a little more because we see more dietitians of color um, that are expressing like, hey, um, I'm Indian, like, why do I have to stop eating curry if, you know, it can be a, a part of a healthy lifestyle. So you are seeing a change um, because there is more diversity coming up in, in this field, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And <clears throat> as I had mentioned, you know, and I want to hear from y'all if you have ever heard from a personal trainer, other professionals, or just people in general, you know, friends, family, that your cultural foods are unhealthy. Um, you know, whatever culture you come from, whether it's soul food, Mexican food, Indian food, Asian food, that that food is unhealthy, it's bad for you, and you should never have it if you're trying to live a healthier lifestyle. Um, you know, give me a thumbs up, say yes, I've heard this before. Um, and if, if you've ever considered eating healthier, the first thing that really comes to your mind, um, I feel is meal prepping, as I mentioned, eating grilled chicken with brown rice and broccoli for the whole week and giving up your favorite foods, the foods that you enjoy, or just your cultural foods. And this is big time, the lack of diversity, because if you don't have someone representing those foods, that culture, then that knowledge isn't there. That knowledge isn't shared. And it makes sense because for me, I'm very familiar with Mexican food. That's what I grew up eating. That's what I'm comfortable with. But I wouldn't be able to educate someone on, you know, typical Indian dishes, how to prepare them, how to make them a little healthier, or even what are healthier options. Um, a big thing is that, for example, in Mexican cuisine, we say like, oh, don't eat Mexican food because it's very greasy, you know, a lot of sour cream, a lot of cheese. But we're focusing on, I guess you could say like the negative, like the, the more fun foods, but our culture has so many, so much diversity and so many different options that you can choose from. There's calabacitas, there's nopales, there's, you know, beans. So, so there's like a whole array of foods that aren't portrayed because, um, you know, there's no one to talk about that. And this, as I mentioned with Mel, this tends to lead to creating a very generic whitewashed diet where you are suggested to replace like your typical rice and beans for, you know, quinoa and garbanzos or like chickpeas, which if you understand how nutrition works and you kind of under, understand the different like macronutrients and components, you, you really get to see that rice can be, it's, it's similar to quinoa, obviously it's not the same thing, but they are, they are exchangeable and then beans and chickpeas are exchangeable too. So you can, in a healthy diet, have rice and beans. Um, 
And as I mentioned, this it tends to be a factor that stops people from even attempting to change their habits and trying to eat a little healthier because just thinking of giving up the foods that you grew up eating or, you know, just foods that you enjoy can be a little scary because it's like this, you know, this is part of me. This is part of, of my family, of my history, especially if you come from a, from a very rich culture, in my case, like Mexican culture, you have recipes from your grandma, from your great grandma, and it's hard to, to let go of them because food isn't just for feeling, like food is history, food is culture, and food is connection. Um, if you're someone that likes to travel, if you go to France, if you go to Italy, you're not going to say, just give me grilled chicken, brown rice, and broccoli. Like you want to experience the culture, you want to immerse yourself in there and learn about the culture. And a really big part is food. So just learning how to, to embrace it and learn how to, to create balance with food will go a long way and it'll really help you. And the second factor is, um, sorry, my lights. Um, it's diet culture and diet culture is basically, you know, this influence that we have seen in the health and wellness industry. And it's the belief that thinness and appearance and body shape are the sole indicators of health. And people that don't fit into these stereotypes or this stereotype of health, they're ostracized because they don't look healthy. Um, as I mentioned, I work at an eating disorder facility for children. So for me, it was very impactful to see the way that diet culture affects our young ones. And even our, like for us as women, um, we're very much affected by diet culture. Um, as you can see on my screen, um, recently there was a device cre created to like shut your mouth so that you can only intake liquids. Um, that was a very big uproar in the dietetics and nutrition community because it's like, why are you creating this contra these contraptions that are meant to just like help people lose weight and not really change their habits? Um, so I'm very big on like really working on how you view yourself because the reason why we want to, you know, be healthy is because we want to feel better but oftentimes correlating being healthy with just being thin we can really get stuck in a vicious dieting cycle where we're just looking for the fastest way to achieve thinness um, and sometimes it really comes up the cost of your mental health and your physical health and the whole point of wanting to be healthy is because you want to feel better and you want your body to be healthy your body and your mind. Um, so doing this through like quick fixes, fad diets, or like magical supplements that promise you results can really detriment your health, mental and physical. And they just don't offer like a long-term solution for you. So this oftentimes also seeps into, into our mind and to the way that we express ourselves about our bodies and about food. So an example is that this oftentimes shows up as like, I'm such a bad person because I gave in and I ate a piece of donut or, oh no, I'm staying away from the bad foods because I'm doing a 30 day cleanse. So you really start to use very negative and you know guilty, shameful expressions when you talk about food, when you talk about your body. So it really tr it starts to take a toll in your mental health. So I really try to help clients understand that health is much, much more than the way you look. And the approach that I like to take is through mindful and flexible nutrition. Um, so before we dive into talking more about nutrition, it's very important for you to have a very clear understanding of your intentions and your why. So what is health? That's the big question. So I want you all to take a piece of paper or simply, you know, write on your notes, um, wherever you can. What does health mean to me? How do I feel? 
And what does this look like? Not just physically, but how is your energy? How's your sleep, your stress, your activity level? Can you go on the hike with a friend and not be dying because you just hiked the mile? Can you go up a, a flight of stairs and not be out of breath? So if you feel comfortable, I would love if you could share, you know, some words or statements of what health means to you and what this looks like for you. Um, this can also be a good prompt if you like journaling, just getting clear on, you know, why you do things, what health means to you and what you want this to look like for you in the future. Like for me, um, health for me is exercising to de-stress, to feel energized and getting some good quality sleep, eating foods that make my body feel great and spending time with friends and family. So that's what, for me, that's what health means. Um, let me see. So a more... Um, Ooh, love this. So I'm going to give you some of the answers that are uh, being put in here. So yes, it just yeah. says having energy to get through the day and feeling rested. Regina says waking up and not being in pain. Roz says, I feel my best when I am balanced with my diet and still achieving results, even if I eat a slice of pizza. Yes, I love that. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a more formal um, definition of what is health from the World Health Organization. They defined it in 1948. And they defined it as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease. So just because you're not sick doesn't mean that you're healthy. You really need to take care of your body, your mind, and your social well-being, like interacting with others, through making connections with friends, family. Um, like I mentioned, if you're trying to live a healthier lifestyle, you don't just, you can't just look at your food intake and your exercise. You have to look at everything as a whole, um, a holistic approach, basically. So oftentimes, you know, starting in this health journey, we do focus just on the physical aspect and we completely tend to neglect our mental health and our social well being. And unfortunately, if we go with society's definition of what health is, which is based on your outer appearance and your looks, we may feel pressure to get these results quickly. And sometimes this really comes at the detriment of your mental, your spiritual, and your social well being, and sometimes at the expense of your physical well being, um, because society puts this pressure on women, especially to, you know, rebound of third pregnancy, to look like you did when you were in high school. So there's always this big pressure for women to take up less space, to be thin, to be fit, but, you know, to be muscular and not too muscular, to have a big butt, but not too big. So it's all these expectations that there are for women. And that's why I ask you, ladies, like, what is health for you? Not what it is for society, not what it is for, for your mom, for your husband, what it is for you and how do you want to feel? Because um, if you are, you know, going through an exercise routine, uh, regimen or diet regimen, but you don't feel good, then it's, you know, is that really healthy? Is that really going to make you healthier in the future? So it's very important to get clear on that. Um so, you know, when you embark on trying to be healthier and this healthy, healthier lifestyle journey, but you have no idea where to start and you go by this definition that health is losing weight, health is following a meal plan or a trendy diet and exercising. Um, and if this meal plan is very restrictive and you don't learn how to incorporate foods that you enjoy, that you like you can feel overwhelmed, you can feel deprived because you're not enjoying your meals. Um, and like I mentioned, food is more than just eating for fuel. It's for connection, it's for enjoyment. So there's more to it. So you can really put yourself in a place where you're like, I, I just can't have this, you're stressed, you're over, over, overwhelmed because you don't want to, you know, quote unquote, fall off the wagon 
So you become hyper-focused on the number on the scale. You become hyper-aware on how your body looks. And you start to notice a pattern that, you know, two weeks in, you're noticing that you're stuck in this cycle where you're eating foods that weren't necessarily on your meal plan or on your diet. So you start to feel guilty. You feel ashamed because you don't have the willpower to stick to it. But you, you, you tell yourself, next Monday, I'm going to start fresh. I'm going to start this diet or this meal plan. So you find yourself stuck in this cycle where it's like deprivation and then feeling guilty and then starting again. And then it's a never ending cycle. So if you feel comfortable, give me a thumbs up if this sounds familiar. You know, this is a safe space, no judgment. But I just want you to see that if this happened to you, you're not the only one. Um, we have all gone through this cycle, unfortunately, because society just puts such so much pressure on us as women to to be thin, to look like the models in the magazines. So, you know, if the if you have seen someone struggle with this or if you have struggled with this, you know, give me a thumbs up. Um, so you see that you're not alone. It's okay. If you've gone through this, there is different ways, that, different routes that you can take. Um, and always remember that if your diet and your exercise regimen leaves you feeling defeated, drained, guilty, ashamed, restricted, it really is time for you to pivot and find something else that makes you feel happy, fulfilled, joyful. Um, and what I basically want you to take away from this is that whatever dietary, dietary pattern you choose to follow should not create food obsessions and it should not be leaving you feeling guilty, ashamed, or restricted. Um, life is meant to be enjoyed and it's, you know, all these negative feelings shouldn't come from your diet. Your diet and exercise routine should not be taking a toll on your mental health. Oftentimes, this is a big thing that I see with clients that they have such unrealistic expectations for themselves because that's what society tells them that it starts to take a mental a mental like a toll on their mental health and that's the last thing we want to see um, happening to a client from their diet or their exercise and finally if your diet and exercise routine is consuming all your time that you no longer attend social events or you're spending less time with friends and family that, and you know, if you no longer have the mental space to develop in other areas of your life, then you really need to find a new game plan because diet and exercise are a small portion of your life. They're not your entire life. So yes, you should focus on your diet. Yes, you should focus on your exercise. That's just a small portion. You need time for friends, family, time for you to grow, time for you to be, you know, creating things and it should not take, it should not take over your life. Yeah, um, I'm just really yes. quickly, you know, like you got several thumbs up. Um, I dropped into the chat, like if I miss starting on a Monday, the whole week is a fail. Um, yeah. And then Roz, asking, if I don't work out in the morning, my entire day becomes a wash. So yeah, this is weird. This is hitting. So thank you. Yeah. And some questions that you can use to reflect if what you're doing right now, what you're currently doing is maybe not, you know, promoting, you know, more, more fun, more enjoyment. Ask yourself these questions and really reflect on them and ask yourself, is this diet causing me more stress? Am I becoming more obsessive with food? Is my body image getting worse? Is it declining? Do I enjoy this form of exercise that I'm doing? Exercise should be for enjoyment. Um, yes, if you like lifting weights, like obviously you're gonna be sore, but if it's something that you enjoy, you know, it shouldn't be something that you dread to do. It shouldn't be something that, you know, you're just not excited about. And um, ask yourself, am I actually creating habits that take my lifestyle into account or am I simply avoiding social events so I can just follow this 
diet or exercise and not, you know, quote unquote, fall off the wagon? Um, these are very, very important questions that you need to reflect on so that you can really understand your intentions and your why of as of what you're, if what you're doing is really supporting what health means to you and how you want to feel in the future. Because a healthy lifestyle should be sustainable in the long term for the rest of your life, not just for the next 30 days, because I would assume that you all want to be healthy for the rest of your life, um, you know, for the things that you can control. I'm sure you want to be healthy for as long as possible. And if the current things you're doing is not supporting that, then we need to pivot and find a new game plan. Um, Because life is too short to be worrying and like getting guilty and restricted and ashamed of the foods that we eat. Um, So if you all have any questions, let me know, but we are going to go on to um, mindful nutrition. Um, Let's see. So mindful nutrition, um, this is, I call it mindful nutrition or flexible nutrition is the approach that I like to take with clients. And it really involves a a mindset shift, especially if all you know is what society tells you, which is that, um, sorry, my lights went off which is that, um, sorry, I lost my spot. It really involves a mindset shift, which if you go by what society deems as healthy or you know doing the right thing, it's oftentimes this progress is related simply to your weight, your body size. Um, but as I mentioned, there is much more to it. So, if you're trying to be more mindful and have a more flexible nutrition approach, you really need to change this old mindset that tells you health is equal to your weight and your body size. And once you reach this body size or this weight, you're going to be happy. Like you're going to be the happiest person in the world. You're no longer going to have problems. Everything's going to be figured out. Um, This is a mindset that we need to change because In this mindset, we simply relate food, calories, and exercise with restriction, sometimes with punishment if we overate, um, or guilt. And we need to change this mindset to, you know, creating health-promoting habits, um, creating habits that you can sustain for the rest of your life, eating to fuel your body and for enjoyment. And adding movement for progression and fun, meaning that you're, you're, if you don't like to run, don't run. There's so many other things you can do. You can do Zumba, you can do boot camp, you can do jazzercise, so many things that you can do. Um, improving your sleep and stress. This is a big one that we all have, you know, we all have poor sleep and we all have a lot of stress. And these are two factors that really affect your nutrition so it's really important to get better sleep and to lower those stress levels Um, and finally creating connections and support systems you know if you can get if you're trying to eat healthier just live a healthier lifestyle inviting your mom or your significant other or your kids on a walk or you know just having them be part of the journey if they want to but if not then finding other like-minded individuals that are really going to support you in this, um, in this journey that you want to, you want to start. Um, So that's what, that's one of the big things that it involves this change in mindset and looking of looking at your nutrition in a more holistic way that involves different parts of your life, not just what you eat and how you move. So your exercise. Um, and it's, it's really important for you. That's why I asked you in the beginning, what health means to you. You really need to be clear on what that means to you and what it looks like so that you can really start tuning into your body and your needs, not your friend's needs, your cousins, the 
latest celebrity you saw in the magazines or on Instagram, it's focusing on you, what you need and what makes you feel better. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the, the main um, parts that I think are very important when you're trying to follow a more mindful and flexible approach with nutrition. So the first one is making peace with food. So what does this mean? So oftentimes we have this idea that there's good foods and there's bad foods. There's foods that are forbidden, forbidden that you should never have. And then there are foods that are good and they're the best for you. We really need to forget about this really black and white thinking um, because there isn't a single food that's going to improve your health and there isn't a single food that's going to detriment your health. Um, oftentimes having this idea of forbidden foods or bad foods starts to create food obsessions and feelings of deprivation, which tends to lead to binging episodes. And as humans, if we, if we're told that we can't have something, we're more drawn to it because we're drawn to what retreats us. That's just how we are. That's how our mind works. So we really need to see food as neutral and not have it hold um, morals. Like I'm a good person because I ate broccoli in a salad or I'm a bad person because I ate a slice of pizza. Food doesn't make you good and it doesn't make you bad. Um, obviously we have, foods that are more nutrient dense, some that are less nutrient dense, but it's all about creating balance and having moderation with all the foods that we consume. Um, and big thing is understanding that there is a lot of nuances in nutrition. You can be the healthiest person in the world and still drink some soda, eat some pizza and eat some donuts. Why? Because as much as we want nutrition to be good food, bad food, or Elizabeth, you're the dietitian, just tell me what to eat, write me a meal plan. Nutrition is much, much more complex than that. It doesn't work that way. Um, believe me, if, if, if we could all write meal plans and just give them to clients to follow, um, that would be a piece of cake but that's not how it works. Um, there's, there's more complexities to it and we have to work with clients on an individual basis to see what works for you because what works for me is probably not gonna work for Maria or for Nancy. So it's really finding what works for you, what you can follow for the long-term. Um, so that's a big thing. And the second important factor is honoring your hunger. So honoring your hunger can be difficult because there are factors that, you know, affect it, but we want to make sure that you're eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're full. Um, for any of you that you're business owners or moms, or you're just really busy, we tend to forget about ourselves because we'll get back, we'll, we'll get to it later. Like, I know I'm hungry, but I got to take the kids to school. I got to run my meetings. Well, if you're not taking care of your body and of your health, then all of that stops. If you're sick, you can't take the kids to school. If you're sick, you can't run your business. So you have to take care of your body and really nourish it so that you can help others because you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, a big, um, also a big thing in our culture, I, especially in like Mexican or like Latino culture, is finish all your food on the plate, clean plates. Um, I don't want to see a crumb on the plate. And this is a cycle that we really need to break because this isn't honoring our bodies or our hunger. Um, we really need to respect that. If we're full, it's okay to stop. Oftentimes this comes from like, scarcity from like living very low income not knowing if you're gonna have food the next day so our parents tend to have this idea that you need to finish everything on your plate and it's just not the case anymore um you can save those leftovers for really honoring your hunger and if you're full you don't have to eat it especially if you're eating out um you can always get a takeout container 
you don't have to get yourself to be at a 10, which is like super full, super stuff that, you know, your stomach hurts. Um, so really connecting and honoring your body and your hunger. You know, some factors do affect it, like stress, sleep, and emotions. Um, so if, you know, emotional eating, that's a real thing. Um, so those are those are factors that we need to address. Um, hunger is your body's way of telling you that you need energy, that you need your, you need, you need fuel to keep going. Um, so hunger is a way of your body communicating with you. You don't have to be afraid of being hungry. Um, being hungry is not a bad thing. And I, like I said, sleep, stress, and emotions can affect hunger. But that is also a way of your body communicating with you that you need to address those things. So you, you don't just ignore hunger. And you're like, oh, I'm hungry. Let me ignore it. You need to see if you're hungry. Okay, maybe eat. If there's other things that are affecting it, let's improve our stress. Let's improve our sleep. Let's learn how to cope with emotions better. Um, so it's, you know, it's a way of your body communicating with you. Number yeah, really, three. Yes. Really quick, Elizabeth, I just wanted to let you know, like, yeah, people are definitely resonating with this. Um, we had someone privately direct message us that they're guilty of neglecting their hunger. Um, and Destiny dropped in the quote, you know, folks are starving elsewhere, which, you know, we've, we've all heard, right, when we don't finish our plate. And I, I had posed the question when I was younger, well, if I'm eating it, they're still not getting it. So how is that? How is that a guilt yeah. for me? Um, and then Yvonne has a question, which we can get to at the end. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, this is, this is definitely resonating. So thank you. Yes. And I definitely have an answer for Yvonne. So, cause I have a two-year-old, I didn't share that, but I'm a mom. I have a two-year-old. Um, so yes, we can, if you have questions, drop them and then I'll try to answer them. Uh, when we, when we get done today. Um, number three is having appropriate meal patterns. So this looks different for everyone. Generally speaking, it's like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and if you need them having snacks. But like I mentioned, if you're tuned into your body and you're hungry, eat. That's your body telling you that you need fuel so that your body can keep going um, to do whatever it is that you need to get done through the day. So if this for you looks like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks, awesome. If this for you looks like just breakfast, lunch, and dinner, awesome. Find an appropriate meal pattern that works for you that's honoring your hunger. And no ladies, coffee is not breakfast. Um, oftentimes, you know, there's like a running joke with dietitians that clients are like, oh, well, for breakfast, I had coffee. And it's like, no, coffee and energy, energy drinks are not a meal. Um, you really need to fuel your body properly so that you can, you know, get your, those nutrients, that energy that your body needs in there. And we'll go over um, how to do that in a bit. Number four, respecting your body. So respecting your body is knowing that your body is powerful and it allows you to do activities that you love and you enjoy. Um, there was a a phrase that was like your body is a powerful tool that allows you to get things done not a pretty ornament to be looked at um, your body allows you to to do things that allows you to walk to run to play with your kids with your fur babies if you have fur babies um, and that we become fixated on the scale on society standards of beauty we can really miss out on all the progress we have made um, you know, can you stretch more? Can you dance better? Can you lift more? Don't let, don't let society's definition of, of, stand, of progress or of beauty standards get in the way of you um, seeing how much you have progressed and how much you have moved forward. So you really need to start thinking of movement and exercise as a form of enjoyment rather than as a way of earning your food or as a right to eat. Um, exercising shouldn't be for punishment either. If you eat a slice of pizza, that's fine, move on. Next meal, is a, it's another opportunity to start fresh and um, create more balance with your meals. 
So you shouldn't be punishing yourself with exercise or using it as a form to give yourself the right to eat. Um, and really following a mindful or flexible approach with nutrition allows you to have that flexibility and choose foods that are nutritious and enjoyable. And it allows you to think of making progress instead of achieving perfection. Um, Mel, you mentioned that it's like, oh, Monday, if I, if I eat something that I deem as bad or like not as nutritious, or if I don't get my workout in, then the whole week is a wreck. It doesn't have to be like that. Think about, you know, being 1% better every single day and every meal being a new opportunity to, to create balance and eat foods that make you feel better. Um, you know, and making making a mindful nutrition or flexible nutrition approach, your focus is on creating habits that will be sustainable in the long term, not just finding the quickest and easiest way to lose weight or to look a certain way, because health is something that you want to maintain for the long term, not just for a week or for the summer. It's something that should be ongoing and continuous. Um, so now I just want to go over, oh, I missed the slide. I just want to go over like how to have balance with your nutrition and how you can apply this into, into your life and into your meals. So when I say balance, I mean having all foods in moderation and having the foods that you enjoy and the foods that are part of your culture having that be part of your healthy lifestyle because that can that is something that should be possible. Um, you shouldn't be living in restriction or living in guilt and restriction when you're trying to eat healthier. So the, the method that I like to share with clients is the plate method. So I like this method because you look at your plate and then a quarter of your plates should be grain foods. So think about like rice, pasta, tortillas, bread, naan, pita. These are your grains, obviously. Um, you know, all the other grains like farro, bulgur, all those. And then a quarter of your plate should be proteins. So carne con chile, grilled chicken, salmon. Um, if you're a vegetarian, lentils, beans, garbanzos, um, fava beans. So all these different um, protein rich foods. And then half of your plate should be fruits and or vegetables. So calabacitas, uh, nopales, um, broccoli, cauliflower, bell peppers, whatever it is that you like. Um, so that this is you know, not forgetting about the fats. So if, if you, usually we add this when we cook, you know, we add fats to our veggies, to our meat, to our grains, but if you don't, then not forgetting about those fats. So this is your avocados, your seeds, your oils. And then if you drink dairy products or non-dairy products, you know, you can have that too. And typically it's recommended for your meals to have three to four food groups meaning that you have, for example, you can have grains, protein, fruit or vegetables, and a fat uh, for meals. So meaning breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then for your snacks, having two to three food groups. So this can be apples, that's your fruit, um, nuts, that's your fat, and then yogurt or a glass of milk or a cheese stick, um, that those are some examples. And um, let me see, I just wanna make sure I cover everything. Um, so a little bit about each food group. So protein and fat. So these are important because they help you feel full and satiated. Um, so when you're thinking about, thinking about snacks, if you have a long time to go between your, your, for example, your lunch and your dinner, 
try to incorporate some protein foods and some fats so that it can help you feel fuller for longer and help you feel satiated. Carbs are your body's main source of energy. So those are important to have too. And then obviously fruits and veggies, you know, they have vitamins, minerals, fiber. Um, so you always want to try and incorporate these into your, into your meals. And another important thing. So here I have an example. Um, usually when you go to a barbecue, it's like you only have meat and beans and you need to ask yourself, well, how can I make this balance? And if you're following the, the plate method, you would say you have your grain, you have your protein. Oh, I can add vegetables or fruit. So then you make half of your plate fruits or vegetables. And if you guys notice, I said, what can I add? So it's very, very important for you to shift your mindset and stop asking yourself, what can I take off? What am I supposed to get rid of? What shouldn't I eat? And ask yourself, what can I add to my meal instead of what can I remove? Um, I know this, this seems like a very simple change. And like, it's like one, like just the way that you word it, but words have power. And you need to think in abundance, not in scarcity. So always asking what can I, what can I add? What can I include? What can I have more of? Because this is correlated with, um, you know, more positive emotions and, and thoughts and more um, psychological well-being. Whereas if you only focus on the negative, like, what can I get rid of? What, what should I stop eating? This is related to behaviors to avoid, to avoidance, and it's just correlated more with negative emotions. So always asking, what can I add? Um, so for example, if you are at work and the only place nearby is like a pizza joint and they have obviously pizza, wings, soda, instead of saying like, oh, well, what can I take off? What can I remove? Ask yourself, what can I add? Um, you can add a side of veggies, a side salad, and automatically you're adding more food. So automatically you're going to have less pizza and less wings. And if this is something you can do and something that's appropriate, you know, maybe not having the soda and having a juice instead or having water, um, always asking, well, what can I add? That's very, very important. Um, so some things is like, can I add water? Can I add more color to my plate? More vegetables, more fruit, more variety. Um, in terms of like overall, can I add more movements? to my life, more sleep, more self-care. Um, always think in abundance, what you can add. Just some take-home messages that I want y'all to take home is don't look for perfection. So always, um, always aim for progress and being 1% better every single day. Um, we know life isn't perfect, so Part of life is your nutrition, your exercise. So you can't expect those areas to be perfect. Things are always gonna come up, like life is gonna get in the way, but always knowing that if you were 1% better than yesterday, you're making progress. Um, always allowing all foods to fit into your diet. Yes, even cultural foods can be part of a healthy diet. Um, and a healthy lifestyle must be sustainable for you. Um, if your friends are doing the trendiest diet that's out there, good for them if they enjoy it. But if this is something that's not realistic for you and you know in your soul that if you were to go keto, this would be the worst thing that can happen to you, then don't do it. Find something that works for you and that makes you feel good inside and outside. Um, creating balance with your, with your meals that includes having multiple food groups, like I mentioned. Um, let me go back it's uh there we go three to four food groups for your meals and then two to three for your snacks um always having that balance in in your meals when you're looking at your plate and not ignoring your hunger and eating until you're satisfied um always honoring your body and like respecting what your body needs and care for your body but also for your mind and your spirit um, I feel like a big thing is that 
we think that if we change the outside and the way we look, we will finally, you know, be more confident and be, you know, be happier, be all these positive things. But it actually starts, the work starts from the inside out. Um, I can tell you, because I've lived it, if you change your outside, um, I know it's not for, and I know this is not the case for everyone, but if you change the outside and you look how you always wanted to look, but you didn't take care of the inside of your mind, of your mindset, you're still going to see yourself the same way. And you're still going to be in that same spot because you didn't work on your mind, on your soul. So always looking at, at yourself as a whole. So this is all I have for you all today. Um, if you want to connect, that's my email. Um, and then um, my main account is Instagram. Um, you can follow me. I do have my coaching application on my bio. So if that's something you're interested in or you want to take a look at, you can fill out the application and then you know, we can see if working together is something that would be beneficial for you and I. And if not, I can definitely connect you with other colleagues of mine that will better serve you and your needs. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, that was really, really helpful. Uh, Justice put in the chat, super helpful information. Thank you. Um, so I know we did not get to Yvonne's question. Um, so I'm going to have everyone, if you are interested in hearing on, what was the question? Sharing tips for encouraging a child to eat a variety and more than one bite. Um, Elizabeth, I'm assuming you're gonna be in your, you're gonna be on, logged on for a while. Um, so if y'all want the answer to that question or have any other questions, just hop into the vendor balance nutrition breakout room. Um, and Elizabeth will be there. She'll be able to tell you more about her business, her offerings, and answer that question and any other follow-up questions that you have. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. That yes. was really great. And I love how, how passionate you were about food being more than just eating for fuel, right? It's connection, it's culture. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes, so, thank you.